What is going on, everybody? This is Patty XRP with the DeFi standard. And, you know, unfortunately, we're going to be getting into some SEC uh, first Ripple case talk here. And, you know, the title of this video is SEC Continued Contradiction, which, you know, every step of the way, they seem to be contradicting themselves. And then also we're going to see what the interview the SEC had with the MoneyGram CFO on the Ripple partnership revealed. And then additionally, how can the Flare network and its, you know, F asset system, its connector with the XRP ledger through the state connector system, how could that play in to the liquidity of XRP? And without further ado, we'll get into it now. And that little that little three second gap right there, that was me just shaking my head in silence at the SEC's latest response in the lawsuit against Ripple Labs. And we'll kind of start off here. And uh, what the SEC is trying to accomplish is they would like a 60 day extension on the discovery process so that they can get more information about Ripple's partnerships with other entities and they basically want to try and construe everything that Ripple has done in a way that shows it's it's been unsuccessful so that they can make the claim that the only way that Ripple makes money uh, is off of their sales of XRP coming from the escrow which you know I think is a pretty weak argument right on its face uh, you know we have firms you know in the past 20 years that have created entire business models around losing money in the hope to set up something great. So like immediately you could think of a firm like Uber or Tesla, maybe Airbnb, you know, not everybody makes money right off the bat. Uh, you get an idea out there, you start working on it, and then investors come in in the hopes that you get to a certain threshold of what you are doing and it starts turning a profit at that point. Uh, so, you know, the SEC is acting like uh, this isn't a thing and, you know, we're going to dive into it here. So to start off, the SEC basically claims that XRP's trading volume today is about three times higher than it was one year ago. In fact, the trading price of XRP today is about four times higher than it was only one year ago. Now, I thought when the SEC was bringing this case, their whole thing was, oh, look, the XRP price moves with how the Ripple team makes announcements regarding their products or partnerships that have to do with the XRP ledger and the digital asset XRP. However, now on the flip side, we have a case that's been filed against Ripple and Brad Garlinghouse and Chris Larson stating that all sales of XRP ever and to present uh, and going forward are inherently security sales, their investment contracts. So can somebody explain to me how after this case dropped that the price of XRP fell all the way to 17 cents from around like 53 cents when it was dropped? I, that's more than a halving in the price. And yet, Within a few months during an extremely hot bull market, the XRP price continued rising back up. It passed where it was at 53 cents and then moved on to almost $2. Can somebody explain that? I thought I thought that everything Ripple does, uh, you know, affects the XRP price. Clearly not. I mean... Yeah, the case has been going relatively well for Ripple, I'd say, to this point. But, you know, I can't imagine the price of XRP uh, rising if everything has to do with Ripple and they're under a securities lawsuit. So to me, they're kind of contradicting themselves already. They're also saying, oh, look, you know, the volume is higher than it was a year ago as well. And I'm like, huh, I wonder if it's because there's a lot more people that are entering into the crypto market. Anybody think that might be a reasonable explanation? I guess the SEC doesn't, but, you know, I'll leave that up to the experts in the courtroom. <laughs> uh, so moving on from there, 
if we go back to the SEC's uh, response to John Deaton's motion to intervene, they basically had um, a whole section with the main argument saying, permitting movements to intervene would necessitate additional discovery and thus delay without contributing to the factual or legal record. And furthermore, they state, though movements claim they do not seek additional discovery, the SEC would likely need discovery from the movements. All of this would impose a significant burden on the SEC and the court and cause undue delay and unnecessary complications in an otherwise straightforward Section 5 enforcement action. All right, SEC. So if you were just saying less than a month ago that, you know, we we didn't want to extend the discovery timeline, like XRP holders shouldn't be heard, John Deaton representing XRP holders shouldn't be heard in this court case, and your argument was that it would cause the SEC to have to conduct more discovery on the parties intervening and cause undue delay, then why are you coming back less than a month later and saying that Ripple needs to provide more documents and you need an additional 60 days? Like, what is going on there? Seriously. Yep, nothing. Crickets. So I would just cause, you know, this is a huge contradiction to me. I think everybody can see it. It's pretty plain as day. Uh, we've already had many media publications come out and basically take a stance against the SEC. Um, if you haven't been following, Roslyn Layton from Forbes has been doing an excellent job. We've even seen the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg get in on them this action. So it's just very frustrating. Like to me, the SEC is such a laughable organization at this point that it's just kind of hard to even want to pay attention to this stuff because they just flip flop around. You know, they're extremely fickle. I think they're just trying to buy their time and somehow force a settlement, which I think is what their next move in this document was, which we'll touch on because the SEC did interview the MoneyGram CFO. And as everybody knows, the MoneyGram partnership with Ripple was terminated back in March of this year. You know, that could be because the SEC case. It also could be what we're about to discuss right now. So basically, I've taken out a few clips from the, I don't know if you would call it testimony of the MoneyGram CFO, you know, whatever you would call the SEC interviewing them in discovery to get information. Uh, but this is going to be a big part of why they're saying, I guess, I guess, honestly, I just assuming this is a big part of why they're asking for additional discovery, even though they didn't really give any argument as to why uh, everything that happened with MoneyGram requires them to have 60 more days. So, in, in the CFO, uh, let's let's go with testimony, maybe incorrect legally, if somebody wants to let me know in the comments after this. But they say, to meet our consumer obligations, MoneyGram must have sufficient, highly liquid assets at all times and be able to move funds globally on a timely basis. And then they additionally say, we pre-position cash in various countries and currencies to facilitate the settlement of our transactions, which we accomplish with foreign currency trades. So the OD ODL model that MoneyGram was using was you take fiat, you purchase XRP. So let's say we're going from um, you know United States to Mexico. You purchase XRP at a US exchange. You then send that XRP over to a Mexican exchange, and then you convert that XRP into Mexican peso. And that's kind of the trip that happens in moving some funds cross border. And what does this do? It, you know, it forces MoneyGram to pay fees on the purchasing side and the selling side. And as we'll see, this honestly didn't work out too well for them. I ultimately don't think the exchange ODL model is necessarily the best model for ODL, but we'll touch on that point at the end. So from there, it says from February 2018 through March 2019, MoneyGram conducted a series of pilot tests using Ripple's ODL platform. It involved 13 trades with XRP, and each of the trades were equivalent to around $100 each with a grand total of $1,225 
used in their so-called, and I'm in quotes behind the screen here, um, you know, pilot test. So what the results showed was that the speed of cross-border transactions was faster using XRP than the company's traditional FX transactions. Not, not a shocker. I would definitely assume that. Uh, I think we've all sent XRP from one wallet to another. It takes a few seconds. Pretty great. But moving on, they also said that MGI recognized significantly higher trading costs by using XRP as a bridge asset in the above foreign exchange transactions. First of all, I don't know if anybody's ever gone on Coinbase or Uphold or something like that and paid the fees on a transaction for $100. It's like 3 or 4%. You know, it's ridiculous for a $100 transaction. It almost makes buying $100 worth of cryptocurrency seem a little ridiculous. So if their whole test is to send that low amount of uh, capital through the ODL process, you know, I don't really think that's sufficient enough. So because of this, Ripple ended up buying a, you know, around 10% stake in MoneyGram uh, that summer, uh, I want to say of 2019. Maybe, yeah, it was definitely 2019, if I remember correctly. And, you know, they wanted to force MoneyGram or give them more incentive to do this on a larger amount. So moving forward, basically MoneyGram did billions of dollars worth of transactions. They were getting rebates from the Ripple team that stated, or they didn't state, but rather in a case where the uh, basis point risk as far as how much fees were paid on a transaction was more than five basis points above their normal foreign exchange fees, then Ripple would reimburse. Um, and they went through this whole process of trying it out. And basically what ended up happening was, you know, this agreement was terminated in 2021, this partnership, whatever you want to call it. And interestingly enough, the CFO did say one potential future benefit identified by the parties at the outset of the commercial agreement was that if such trading were performed by MoneyGram at scale, for example, a significant majority of its total foreign currency trading is performed through ODL, then they might be able to pre-position less capital around the world and thereby achieve significant cost savings through this less capital intensive process. So, you know, the CFOs coming out and saying, yes, if this is performed at scale enough for us to remove all this pre-positioned capital and utilize it in some other way, then we could have some serious cost savings there. But, you know, they didn't really do that much in transactions for what the business does in general. Uh, you know, it was only through a few corridors and ultimately, you know, I think it's probably hampered by regulatory issues in the U S. So honestly, if you want to criticize ripple for anything, it may be sticking around in the U S for too long. Although I personally am happy as a U.S. citizen they have, I appreciate somebody trying to build something with blockchain here, but our regulators are just going to continue to make it hard. Um, and then, you know, finally here, they also have a statement. So when MoneyGram transfers funds, like we were saying earlier, using the ODL platform, it pays fees to exchanges on both sides of the transaction. So like one in the originating country and then one in the receiving country. It's just, it's not going to work like that. So this takes me back to um, a tweet that Mickey really likes from David Schwartz that basically says the ultimate future of ODL is many competing global pools of liquidity that firms, companies, nations, individuals can just draw off of. So think about just many different liquidity pools with XRP against some fiat currency or XRP against some crypto asset. That's that's like where they want to be in this exchange model because you're paying double fees on the, you know, the side leaving the country and then on the side entering the country and swapping between their fiat not necessarily the best for MoneyGram. But let's not forget, MoneyGram, when Ripple invested in them, uh, was a failing company, and their stock price was in the gutter. Uh, I remember specifically last March or April in 2020, I bought some MoneyGram stock for a dollar. Uh, it used to be priced at over $200 at one point before the housing crisis of 07 to 09. Um, so it was really cheap. And you know, they were losing money and this deal that they had with Ripple actually, you know, 
put them into a net profit. But obviously, that was coming from Ripple supporting them for testing out ODL. Now, where does that leave us? You know, and one of the parts of this video was that I want to say, how can Flare play into XRP liquidity? The issue with MoneyGram here was that XRP was not liquid enough to provide cost savings. And how can Flare help with this? So the Flare network, by its nature, you can mint F assets from some underlying chain onto the Flare network, but it doesn't lock up the native asset. You know, a lot of bridges will just lock the asset being bridged over in, you know, into some smart contract escrow that you get back when you come back to the network. However, the way Flare is doing it is a much more capital, I would say, efficient process, I guess, an efficient capital process. It allows you to still use the underlying asset on the native chain. And what does Ripple need? It needs more XRP and more corridors so that this thing can really scale out. So by the nature of, let's say, an individual like myself, I mint, let's say, 50,000 FXRP. Well, that's 50,000 XRP that I'm now delivering to some exchange, to some central, fi like, CFI firm. Um, you know, it could be an investment fund if they want to participate as an agent. And now they can do whatever they want with that capital. And then we just see that David Schwartz comes out and proposes side chains, uh, federated side chains for the XRP ledger. Definitely seems like it's been the, in the works for a while. And these could provide a perfect opportunity to make some kind of DeFi or liquidity pool organization for these agents to earn yield and utilize the XRP that they are now custodying in the F asset system process. And additionally, you know, if you don't know as much about how the F asset system works, just know that the FXRP that's minted is backed by two and a half times the US dollar value of that FXRP in the Spark token. And then additionally, on the side where the agents have control of the underlying assets, if they do not return the, let's say, XRP in this case, to a person trying to redeem their XRP, then they will lose 50% of their collateral. Pretty significant loss. So the system's set up in a way for it to be honored. It makes sense to participate correctly uh, because you'll either be hurt uh, really bad financially or, um, you know, put into some kind of difficult situation. So honoring the system is the best way to earn money and participate. But um, yeah, enough of my long-winded rant. I uh, hope you guys enjoy it and kind of see how these puzzle pieces will go together. Uh, I am curious if anybody is seeing the MoneyGram info as particularly bad. You know, I think their play with MoneyGram was more for the last mile uh, of payments rather than actually using them to uh, further their ODL practice. And then on top of that, we know that Ripple has many other partners that are using ODL, especially in Southeast Asia, uh, where it's a lot more friendly to crypto. Uh, but that's gonna be it for me on this Saturday, the 12th. Uh, the Spark claim is finally in, and you should be seeing um, some information on how much Spark went unclaimed and will then go in to the general F asset rewards pool uh, next week per the, uh, or next week. I think I said weed there. <laughs> um, but that'll be going uh, out on Twitter or something. You know, Flare Network will make a publication about it. So hopefully we'll find out in a couple days. But anyways, hope you guys enjoy your weekend. It's finally gotten sunny after a bunch of rain. And uh, I'll see if I can catch any dips in the XRP price this weekend. But I'll catch y'all uh, next time we're on. Take care.